So I've always been a Diamond Dallas Page fan. Um, just whenever he was younger, just coming out looking like a badass that he did and, you know, hitting that diamond cutter all at any time. Um, he was very inf influential to me, especially with uh, the age that he was at whenever he finally got to start wrestling. I started very late as well. Um, I didn't start wrestling or training even until I was 26, 27. I had my first match. So I was getting in very late. So that was also something that I had in common with him. Um, and then one day, like this company I was telling you for IWR, um, he was on, on one of our flyers. And I was like, oh, no way. He's, he's coming to the show. He's going to be at the show. Like DDP is coming to this show. Oh, my God. Hell yeah. So excited. I was like a kid in the candy store. But I've never asked to take a picture with any of the names that I've ever seen a show. I've just I've always felt like uh, the conversations I get to have with them mean more. Um, and sooner or, later, sooner or later down the road, I'd like to have a couple pictures with some of them, but I've, I've never taken a picture with anyone. And I was telling myself, hey, I'm, don't, don't take a picture. Don't ask for the picture. Don't ask for a picture. Just be polite, be nice, shake his hand, whatever. Well, the promoter tells DDP when he gets there that um, there was someone he wanted to meet. And then I'm in the locker room, literally putting on my gear. And I've got one leg going into my wrestling gear, the other leg completely out. And I'm literally in just nothing but my boxers underneath and no shirt. And DDP comes walking as I'm trying to straddle my stuff. And I look up and I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> Perfect <laughs> time. <laughs> Let me put my pants on. <laughs>
Uh, it was supposed to be me and Will all day, and then uh, he had some family things he had to take care of, which we all respectfully uh, prayed for him as well, keep making sure keep him in our minds. But, um, you know, Fuego and Niles, their fun is always, um, always been a great match, always been great competition with those two. And I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but at the same time, like, uh, it was just fun. Um, and I, I have no doubt that tomorrow's going to be fun as well. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit more of an upscale type task for me. Nothing that I haven't seen before. I mean, I've been in the ring with the likes of people like Loki, Mecha Wolf, um, you know, Gino. I've, I've been in the ring with Matt Cross. I've been in the ring with Brian Cage, um, Chavo Guerrero Jr., a, or AR Fox. I mean, I've, I've ACH. I've been in the ring with these guys. So, I mean, Me Mecha Wolf is Mecha Wolf. I'm going to go in there just like I do with everybody else, except for this time I'm not coming out empty-handed i'm gonna come out with the big bad, bad wolf that's what the fuck i like to hear man because i did my research i was looking into your career uh before tomorrow's match with mecha wolf and before we get into talking about tomorrow's match let's take it back a little bit uh you know i was looking into an article that i saw that you did a little bit earlier in your career from medium.com and i i found some things that uh kind of stuck out to me so I figured out that you started watching wrestling around the same time I did because it says that in 2000, 2001 is when you started watching wrestling, which I was in the height of my watching wrestling at that point. So I hear that Rock and Shawn Michaels are your favorite. Tell me a little yeah. bit about how you got into wrestling and what are some of your favorite memories from growing up? So whenever I was younger, um, my mom pretty much raised me and my, my younger brother um, by herself until I was about 12. My brother was about 10. Um, and, and for as long as I can remember, like we weren't allowed to watch anything, just like really graphic. Uh, we were supposed to be just G rated everything we watched on TV. Mom was really straightforward. So, so we just really minded our own business that way. But when she started dating again and, uh, my stepdad came into the picture, it was one of those things where my mom worked late night shifts at the hospital because she was a nurse. And, um, dad would be like hey y'all want to watch wrestling and it was always one of those things where you're like oh but mom said we can't but it turned into one of those what mama doesn't know doesn't hurt her kind of things um and she eventually found out later but it, it really blossomed from just the kind of keeping it a secret that we were watching it um all the way to we were literally watching it at my dad's work and at the time he worked for a company called cox communication which is cable and satellite tv and uh they had a huge like it covered the entire wall. Like I, I would say it's a literally like a 20 foot by 20 foot wall that goes all the way across. Um, and they had a huge projector that they would literally put up on the wall. And that's how we started watching like the pay-per-views and stuff. Um, but that, that's how I kind of started watching wrestling. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. I got interested and in, uh, I fell off a little bit after high school, but um, you know, everyone has their college fun and stuff. I did my college fun and then I caught right back up and, I've been running full steam ever since, but two people that really had always like inspired me in wrestling were Shawn Michaels one, because I can relate to him. I'm a Texas boy. Um, you know, I'm not always been the biggest, but I also have a lot of heart, you know, kind of thing. Um, he was really educated with his feet and, uh, you know, I happen to be really educated with my feet as well. So there's a lot of similarities. Um, also just love the way he sold, um, he's one of the guys that I really try and mimic my selling after. Like I try and think in my head, what would Shawn Michaels do when taking this move or selling to this, this area? Like what can I do to improve on top of that? Like I really enjoy um, the factor of selling in, in wrestling, but um, Shawn was one of the best. And that's, I think why I fell in love with him and made you fall in love with him because he really showed you that, you know, he was in pain. Uh, and then the rock just literally the, most electrifying man, of course, but um, he, he really means that and sticks by it. He really is like you walk into the room and you see Dwayne the Rock Johnson standing there and all heads turn. So um, just two guys that really inspired me and I try to keep the charismatic side like the Rock and I try and really keep the um, entertainment value side uh, like Shawn Michaels. Well, Corey, I've been flapping my gums enough for a little bit. What do you got for our guest? Well, this is honestly kind of a question I've been asking a lot of the wrestlers that we've had on lately. I feel like um, 
a lot of the sports entertainment, and I feel like you kind of just got into it right there with your whole Shawn Michaels and The Rock comparison. How much do you feel of the wrestling game nowadays is more entertainment over sport or sport over entertainment? Because it seems like in some aspects it's really lacking on the higher end in like the WWE and stuff. You really hear like the complaints about like the writing not being up to par and stuff like right. that, what it used to be. So do you feel like the sport is starting to take over? Like I consider it myself roughly like a 70-30 entertainment leaning over the sport, at, you know. Yeah. Uh, where do you weigh that in at? And, and uh, why? I agree. I agree with you on the, uh, it, it is turning into more of a sport. And I think that's something that we did ourselves too, because we were, we were, were at the very beginning, just entertainers. We did go out there and we were wrestlers. And when they first started wrestling, they were really beating the crap out of each other because they thought that's what they had to do to make it look real. You know, it, it's one of those things now where we may have too much sport in wrestling because the stories matter. The stories are what keep people coming back. The story is what's, can bring someone into a whole new world with you um like in the ring like making them invest with you making them believe and want to see you at the next show because hey you were supposed to beat that guy but he cheated and now we're going to see what you did to him at the next match like there's there's a certain time when you have to say hey i am comfortable saying that i am a sports entertainer i'm a very athletic guy i know it so i know that i'm an athlete i i know what I have here is an athletic body. I was gifted this and I'm trying to put it to the best use that I can. But I also understand that once I step through those ropes and I go into that ring, I am now an entertainer as well. And I now have to put on a show while performing athletic feats. It doesn't always have to be athletic. I mean, you could always have a great wrestling match where it's just nothing but holds back and forth with a bunch of pins that lead up to the finish. Like, that's fine, but story matters. If there's no story, there's no reason for them to come back. There's no investment. Why are we doing it then? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's that's what that's why I've been asking the question lately is because I feel like that's something that is starting to get away from it a little bit. I agree. I agree with you. It's, it's something that would would be. I think it would it'd be a new way to kind of interchange after COVID because it used to be all about the story, and then it's really here in the past couple of years turned into the the feats of all the acrobatics and the what it can really turn into actually be a sport and i think we're getting lost in the fact that wrestling is a sport yes we we've all we've all agreed with that because that's incredible things that a lot of people do inside that ring but at the same time we have to understand and say yes we're also entertainers it's like watching a movie dude you got a good guy you got a bad guy you got love you got drama you got all these things that can intertwine and we do it right we do it together and we all work on the same page and tell a good story people are going to keep watching people are going to keep coming back and i think that's just something that right now with covid after this is really kind of starting to break down and and shows are kind of starting to come back together and open up now i think we need to go back into storytelling more we're going to need to bring more people we're going to need to show them hey you have a reason to come back not just because Hey, you've seen A and you've seen B, you've seen them both a hundred times, but now they're going to wrestle again, or they're going to wrestle guy D down the street. You know, I mean, stories matter. And the more stories we have, the more community we're going to have in the wrestling. So that brings up a good point that I wanted to ask about. So, you know, you've been doing your thing now since 2016. So you've had about five years experience under your belt. So along the way, tell me how getting in the ring with guys like Chavo Guerrero, really helped uh you know your development along the way and what were the things that you felt were biggest that you needed to work on when you were starting out um so i got very lucky when i started wrestling i i started wrestling with a company called iwr and it was literally the company that was back funded by a lot of uh, a lot of money and a, and, a, and a money guy and he just wanted to bring in a whole bunch of big name talent and i had just graduated their school so i was literally right off the bat after like my sixth or seventh match, I was getting thrown into these matches with big name talents. So um, Chavo was my very first one and, and I was so nervous. Um, I can still remember like to this day, like there's a lot of people we're talking about storyline stuff where there's a lot of people that, um, you know, we're going over their storylines for, for that match and that show. And I went and talked with Chavo that day. And then this, this is also the day that I realized that 
I'm either going to flop or I'm going to succeed all in one match right here. It's going to show me either I've got what it takes, right? It doesn't because I literally walked in to talk to Chavo and I said, Hey, what kind of story are we telling here? And he goes, I'll tell you out there. And that is, that's it. That's all I got from him all the way up until the time we got into the ring. That man is so dang good. So smooth, so easy going in that ring that he literally guided me all the way through a 20 minute main event match for the strap that I was holding for the company. So, um, and then he put me over afterwards, learning a lot right there in one little area. The biggest takeaway I, I take away from that is he put me over. That's a guy who has 20 plus years in this business and I wasn't even a full year in and he put me over. Selfless. You got to have it in wrestling. You just have to. Um, that guy coached me the entire time. That's when I noticed talking was a big thing. I needed to figure out how I was going to be able to communicate with people in the ring without actually talking to them. Um, we don't want to make it obvious, of course, right? You don't want to sit there and just start talking to you like I'm talking to you now and telling people what to do. Like, there's a way to do it. And he taught me that all in one real easy, simple go right there. Um, the Steiner brothers. I mean, I got to wrestle both of them with my tag team partner at the time. And that was a, a shocker. Like that was an educator right there. Like learning on the fly, doing and as Corey, you think. Corey, do you know the background on the Steiners? No, go ahead. The Steiners are from Michigan, firstly, secondly. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you've got the fact that, dude, these guys were like badass wrestlers at U of M. And they're big as fuck. So, yes. like, <laughs> and they're agile, too. So, like, to give you, like, context, to wrestle against them, you're getting twisted up, man. There ain't no, there ain't no <laughs> way around. Big it. boy, some big boys with traditional, you know, collegiate level wrestling under their belt. Yeah, I could, yes, I could imagine. Yes, they're, just they're wanted to lay the context for anybody that wasn't aware of what is the Steiner brothers. Steiner brothers were they were the they were the tag team, man. They were woof. They put a hurting on you in a hurry if you weren't, if you weren't careful, but. Um, just, just learning with guys like that. So I got an early jump start with that company and, and I got an early education by those guys because I, I was literally in kindergarten. I was working with college graduates, you know, like working into their, their fields. Like those guys were teaching me the ropes as I was going. And I think that's why I was able to learn so quick and so fast just in my short time and become to get to where I am because I thrive under being thrown to, to the sharks and, the, and like finding my way trying to figure out on my own. I, I've always thrived on that. Um, and it, it's a scary situation at times. Um, but, but I also know that at the end of that situation that I'm going to come out um, better for it. So um, I hope I answered your question with that. It was all oh, hey, Amen. Man, that was perfect. Like I said, <laughs> I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Cause like I said, I did, I did my digging. I saw, um, I saw, you know, some of the stuff that you've got to do along the way. Another guy that I saw that you mentioned has been very influential for you is a guy who is also a fellow past guest of this show in DDP. Ooh. So tell me a little bit about that. So I've always been a Diamond Dallas Page fan. Um, just whenever he was younger, just coming out looking like a badass that he did and, you know, hitting that diamond cutter all at any time. Um, he was very inf influential to me, especially with uh, the age that he was at whenever he finally got to start wrestling. I started very late as well. Um, I didn't start wrestling or training even until I was 26, 27. I had my first match. So I was getting in very late. So that was also something that I had in common with him. Um, and then one day, like this company I was telling you for IWR, um, he was on, on one of our flyers. And I was like, oh, no way. He's, he's coming to the show. He's going to be at the show. Like DDP is coming to this show. Oh my God. Hell yeah. So excited. I was like a kid in the candy store, but I've never asked to take a picture with any of the names that I've ever seen a show. I just, I've always felt like um, the conversations I get to have with them mean more. Um, and sooner or later, sooner or later down the road, I'd like to have a couple pictures with some of them, but I've, I've never taken a picture with anyone. And I was telling myself, Hey, I'm, don't don't take a picture don't ask for the picture don't ask for a picture just be polite be nice shake his hand whatever well the promoter tells ddp when he gets there that um there's someone he wanted to meet and then i'm in the locker room literally 
putting on my gear and I've got one leg going into my wrestling gear, the other leg completely out. And I'm literally in just nothing but my boxers underneath me, no shirt. And DDP comes walking as I'm trying to straddle my stuff. And I look up and I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> perfect <on>. time <laughs> let me put my pants on <laughs> uh, but it was really cool because i got to introduce it uh, or i got to talk to him for a little bit afterwards and um before uh before he left uh, he went out in this segment like right before my match and uh, we had talked for a little bit and he was like oh so you're right after me right i was like yeah we're our segment's right after yours and he goes cool mind if i watch and i was like um <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like yeah, like, absolutely. Um, and it's funny because it was me, Fuego del Sol, and uh, Montigo Sica at the time, which he wrestled out of Oklahoma. And um, it was a triple threat match for the IWR Revolutionary Championship that I was holding. And, uh, you know, DDP does this segment, and he, we're coming from backstage, and we're all in the grill kind of getting ready. And he walks through, and he looks at me, and he goes, all right, I'll be watching. Don't mess up, and walks off. And so we go out. We have this match and everything, and – they we went pretty well, uh, had fun, introduced, like the crowd was in, the energy was there with them. So um, all in all, it was a really good match. And uh, we came back behind the curtain and DDP is just like over there in the corner where he was watching. He just got like this stern look on his face, his hands on his hip and he's just standing there looking at us. And we're like, oh no, we did something wrong. This dude is fixing to look <laughs> into us. No, this is not what we needed. And uh, so we start kind of walking up to him and we get a little closer to him and he just starts slowly raising a smile. He's like, I'm not going to lie, boys. That was probably one of the best triple threat indie matches I've seen in a long time. And I was just like, in that moment, I was just, I, I was, I was good. I could have been done. DDP gave me the, Hey, you did it kind of, kind of nod. And it's awesome. So um, he, he stuck around for a little bit. After. He uh, gave me some, email on his phone and he hooked me up with DD yoga which i do all the time still and uh we we've talked here and there um he, before covid uh we had talked and he got me hooked up with cody and uh qt marshall at aew and i did a little extra work for aew uh through ddp but uh we, we talk here and there um but, but really it's kind of come to one of those things where i've kind of taken on in my own career and i, I kind of ask when i need and um he's very busy with what he does as well with the yoga and or, I'm sorry, DDP yoga. Do not just say yoga. Anymore. I was going to say, don't do that, bro. You're going to catch a diamond cutter, yeah. man. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. But um, good man, uh, and I will forever be thankful for everything he's done for me. All right. So I don't know if I told you the story when we was in Texas last time, but I have a very similar story with DDP, too. So yeah, let's hear we were at uh we were at Starcast three. We got there because we interviewed Dave Silva, who does a lot of the graphics for uh you know Conrad shows. And so uh when we were on there with Dave, Dave was like I asked him, I was like, you know, hey man, you know, how you know what do I gotta do to get us on there for like credentials and stuff? Cause like I didn't get it because I kept seeing all these other podcasts and all this stuff on there. Well, he's like, dude, he I we'd already had a few people on at that point, and so uh he put us in touch to get over there. Well, our buddies from Breaking Down the Ring, who we do pay-per-view parties with here all the time before COVID fucked all that up, oh. uh, they had a they had a booth at Starcast. We're sitting there chilling. They sit DDP right next to us. Looks looks to our, looks to his left, sees all the signs, looks up, looks down, looks up. So uh, you guys are a podcast. So uh, you gonna interview me, bro? <laughs> <laughs> right there on the spot no prep no nothing i was like yep <laughs> there was no like i was like i ain't gonna say no to that but like and then it was cool because like the whole rest of the weekend uh we were there it was like it was like we were homies and it was like dude i've like you said been watching that dude since i was a kid so yeah. like it was definitely cool he's definitely one of those kind of people a lot of people you 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 know you see him on tv and you wonder what they're going to be like when you meet him in person but he's definitely what you would hope he would be like right um, they say don't meet your superstars but at the same time like he's he's one of the superstars that i'm i'm definitely happy i met all right well let's take it a little bit away from wrestling for one second uh we also cover MMA. We could like the UFC, the bare knuckle FC, all the FCs. The question is, do you get down with the FCs? Mr. Hopson, Mr. Hopkins, if I can spit it out. 
right. Um, I actually have not been watching UFC the past couple of years. The last time I really started, like, was watching UFC was whenever Silva was, like, the main dog in, in all of it. But um, So it's been a few years, but I, I can do my, my best for you. Hey, man, I just was wondering uh, if you was a fan of the fisticuffs, man, because, uh, like I say, we cover all that stuff as well. We're just wondering what you were thinking. Did you watch the Conor McGregor fight? I actually did watch that fight. Uh, me and my roommate, uh, the Magnificent Malico, uh, we actually watched that fight. And, man, he, I'm not sure. What, the way he went down, I'm not going to say he threw it. I'm just saying, didn't look like, <laughs> didn't look like, didn't look like a Connor that, that I ever seen watching. Come on, I'm man. <laughs> you really think he threw it? Man, I don't think he threw it, but I don't think he was really, I don't think he came into that thinking he was the best Connor that he could be. Uh, I mean, he just didn't, he didn't look like himself. He didn't look comfortable. He didn't look ready. The guy was backing him into a fence the entire time. And then literally he, he hit him on the face. It may have been the jaw. It, it may have been, and they say on the button, he'll do it every time. But like, it barely looked like it hit him. And then he just sat down and looked at the guy and let him let him just pummel him a couple of times. Like, he didn't really even try and stop himself. Just saying. <laughs> well, I, I agree with that ending assessment. I, I do. It was kind of, especially to somebody who hasn't been like entrenched in the UFC, because that's, I, cover more of the mma side of the podcast where kyle's right. more of the wrestling side so we we get back and forth on that and balls deep as i am that leg was just chewed up i mean he said it after the fight yeah. his leg was just beat to hell man and i know it might not have looked like much he was just barely kicking his foot you know but Boy, I've been watching these fights for entirely too long, and you let somebody like Dustin throw even like four or five of those kicks solid, and they land the way that they did. He he couldn't put pressure on that front foot. So I agree with your uh, the final hurrah wasn't as like knockout worthy as it may have came across to some people, but it was an accumulation more than it was like the final strike in my eyes. Right. So I've never really had somebody fuck my calf up like that, but I can tell you from somebody kicking you in the leg like that. So past guest of our show, Miles Jury, who was a seven year UFC vet and now fights for Bellator. Even when somebody's not trying to throw it like full bore, like blasting somebody, man, getting kicked on like the inside of the leg, outside of the leg, like you accumulate a few of those, man. And I'm telling you it's bro it gets to the point where you can't put weight on your foot. And if you can't put weight on your foot for somebody like Connor, you got to realize Connor's got that real wide base. So if you take his legs out, he can't generate the same power to throw his punches. Cause if you watch that first round, man, he was really, he was really giving it to Dustin. And I would say you could even say he won round one, but when you come into round two and he starts smacking him with them calf kicks, you can visibly see that he can't move as much, which, you know, from your style in the ring, a person who can't move a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest doesn't really do very well. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It sure doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So, I'm just saying, even though the leg kick doesn't always look like it's the most uh, damaging thing in the world or the most effective thing in the world, let me tell you. Fuck all that. I'm good on somebody kicking me in the calf. The same with that John Jones kick to the knee. I'm good on all that shit, fam. Keep yeah. that shit away from me. I'll just kick that, you in the dick. Uh, that side kick to the knee is dirty. Dude, I cringe every time I watch him throw that because I had a real bad scare one time when they grabbed uh, – I got had a guy grab a single leg. We were doing Shark Tank to help a guy get ready for a fight. So, like, every, like, two minutes or whatever time uh, they had on there – Somebody else would have to come in there. Well, I went to go in. He grabs a single leg. I do what you're supposed to do to try to get out. I turn, shove, uh, you know, shove his head down, go to pull my leg out. And as I pull my leg out, he quick whips my leg to the other side. And I'm like, it, like, I felt it pop. And it, like, made me yell even without, like, trying to, like, yell. You know what I mean? Like, it was one of those where, like, I just did it out of instinct. Luckily, it didn't tear nothing. But ever since then, man. Anything with the knees, I'm good on that. I'm good on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, one question I do got for you, you kind of brought it up earlier in the interview, is uh, 
what made you get into it a little later in your uh, in your career, I guess you could say, in, in the in the career of life? What, what made you decide to circle back to wrestling and uh, really give it a shot? Uh, well, I was actually selling cars whenever I had the opportunity presented itself to me. And just uh, like I big show. Yeah, it was kind of weird, yeah. Um, and it, it kind of just came to me out of, from a friend that I worked with. And uh, the work had given us tickets to go to the Chesapeake Arena for WWE Raw one night. And um, the guy didn't have anywhere, one to go with. So he asked me, he's like, hey, man, you want to go to wrestling? And I was like, where at? And he was like, uh, it's a chess peak. It's raw. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go with you. So we get there, and he's sitting here trying to tell me who all these people are and, like, what they were doing and how it works. And I kind of looked at him, and I was like, yeah, I know. And I just started explaining everything to him back at him. And he was like, oh, so you, you're a wrestling fan. And I was like, I watched a lot growing up. Yeah, no problem. And he was like, have you ever been to an indie wrestling show? And I was like, what the hell is an indie wrestling show? He goes, oh, man. He's like, it's like the triple A's or minor leagues, but for wrestling. And it's literally guys going at it, trying to show that they, they like, built their stock to become, like, one of the guys on TV. And I was like, oh, okay, so where, where are these things at? And they go, oh, they're traveling around all over the place. Sometimes they stop by. There's one stopping by. And it was the IWR that I was telling you guys about. And they stopped by. And in intermission, they announced that they were having some tryouts. And um, so I went home and I looked up their website to see who all was there. And I started seeing all these names that were there. Kevin Nash had been there. Jabo had been there several times. Jerry, uh, JR, Jim Ross helped with it. And I started seeing all these names on their stuff. And I was like, okay. So I sent him my application and stuff, and videos that they needed. And uh, literally like five minutes later, they had sent, uh, sent me back an email saying, yeah, we'd love to have you. These are start dates. This is the cost can you be here well the training was literally on weekends and in car sales weekends you don't get off like that's your sales days you get you get two days off during the week unless you work in oklahoma which i was where we got sunday off because it was the bible belt mandatory for everybody and then i got one day off during the week every other day i was mandatory had to work so i had to go literally hoax my boss into letting me have every weekend off um, and so we're literally sitting there and, um, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to tell him. And I just say, Hey, I signed up for wrestling. Um, they accepted me. They want me to show up. It's on this date. And I just dropped it in front of him and he like looked up at me and he goes, that's a Saturday. And I was like, it's actually Saturday and Sundays. And he goes, but still that's a Saturday. And I was like, yes, every week. And he goes for how long? And I was like, I don't know. They didn't tell me how long until it would be until I'm actually fully trained to start wrestling. So he's like, all right. And we set some goals out and he was like, you tell you what, you sell X amount of cars a month, even with being gone all weekend and you can do it. I was like, all right, cool. Uh, it was like 12 cars a month, nothing crazy, but um, kept my quota all the way through. Um, and I was training in Ardmore, Oklahoma while living in Oklahoma city, Oklahoma. So those are about two hours difference from each other. So I would drive down on a Saturday morning, train all day Saturday, sleep in my car, get up Sunday and train all day Sunday and then drive back two hours. Um, and that was my weekend schedule for about three months um, until they decided to shotgun me straight to the ring. And I actually debuted in a uh, uh, story with uh, Magnus and Malico where he had kidnapped me and stuff and, and brought me into or trying to brainwash me into his world. So that, that was my entrance into wrestling and how it kind of uh, came to be, though. It sounded like you dived real uh, headstrong into it, man. Going from, oh, I'll take this training day to, I'm going to sleep in my car so I can make sure I make both days and not have to travel back and forth. That's, yeah, that's uh, real dedication. It, I, it was something I literally told myself because I didn't tell anybody I was doing it. I didn't even tell my mom I was doing it until after I was almost done with training, like, she would just see like these random pictures and not really, I guess, realize what I was doing. And then finally I told her I was like wrestling and she goes, now all those things make sense. And I was like, yeah. And uh, I don't know. She's always been one of those things. I tell myself I'm going to do something. Um, I'm going to put, put my all into it. Uh, I'm not going to just, Hey, let's do this. And then half-ass do it and hope it works out. Like I knew that it was probably my last hurrah at staying 
and becoming an actual athlete still because that's all what I always always wanted. It was always football for me though. I always wanted to be a professional football player. What position um, did you play? I played wide receiver, cornerback. I uh, did a little running back in high school, and I was kicking punt return man. See, we got even more in common with you because we both played football too. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish my big ass would have uh, cared a little more about the ball instead of uh, the the weed and the women. But uh, oh. <laughs> Dude, I can say that one because it took me down a different road myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I completely feel you on that, man. I really, as I've gotten you know a little older in age and had kids and grew up and played that whole game now. I really wish that's one thing I would have took a little more serious when I was younger. I mean, not to go bragging or nothing. Six, six, three, two hundred. I could have easily played, you know, Division two somewhere easily. Yeah. I was ca- I was captain of the football team for four years. I could have definitely played somewhere. You got, you got the height already right there. I got yeah. just put the fundamentals around it. I tried to get this big lanky bastard to fight with me, but I mean, hey, <laughs> hey. That one I can say full heartedly was not my fault. That one was a, hey, mom, I can't pay for these classes because I'm still 17. Come on, sign me up. Come on, take me. Come on, come on. You can only beg so much. I can't say shit, dude. I got put into boxing when I was 13, man. I took my first fight at 13. (laughs) Woo. Yeah, that was an experience. You talk about, uh, weird places for a show man we were fighting outside in a parking lot in detroit next to a gay strip club (laughs) in the middle of the day (laughs) you had all the fun yeah okay yep yeah we had we had we had did you win the fight what'd you say did you win the fight no that one i didn't win (laughs) uh but i did find out that boy i could knock the shit out of somebody though because that's about that still to this day is the hardest i've ever hit somebody in my life yeah. Because that kid was whipping my ass bad for like two rounds. And then I finally made a miss and I hit him so hard because we were fighting with 10 ounce gloves. So I felt my, I could feel my knuckles hit him through the glove. And he went one, he went from one end of the ring to the other. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like now, if I could go back and redo that, I would have jumped on it a lot quicker. But <laughs> yeah. at the time as a 13 year old kid, I'm like, Holy shit. Also, You're- mind you, the reason I got into boxing was because I got bullied a ton because I grew up with cerebral palsy and Crohn's disease. I used to wear braces and couldn't cut with scissors or tie my shoes, write my name, none of that kind of shit. So for me, it was like a complete reversal of roles for me to even get into fighting. And now at this point, it was really the basis for which this show was started because, like I said, and for those that have been following us for a long time, no, I mean, I just randomly went to WrestleMania 33 by myself, linked up with Devin, and he's talking about he's such a fight fan, and I had my connections through the fight game, and here we are now. So, there you go. Nice. You never know where the fuck you end up. <laughs> I got to keep going see where the, see where the road takes you. All right, well, your road is taking you to Pele Pro Wrestling this Friday against Mecha Wolf. Uh, any last thoughts on the match? Um, and before we go into that, one last question I do have for you. You know, being from Texas, I know you probably had to get hit with the, stereoty- uh, the stereotype with the cowboy deal because most people, when they see cowboys in wrestling, they think of uh, a Stan Hansen or, mm-hmm. you know, the old school Bradshaw look or something like that but your style is so different from that because you're high flying and everything else um did you have any hesitancy to that and have you caught any backlash ever because of that because it's the stereotypical you know cowboy deal right um no i I don't think i I really struggled making it my own and that's what i always kind of wanted to set it out to do um whenever i did say i was going to be a cowboy people kind of looked at me and was like but there's so many of them why and you know whenever they start when they said that like i looked around the indies and just looked up names and stuff and typed in see how many cowboys that were out there and when i started talking about doing the cowboy there there wasn't any cowboys in texas doing it like texas and oklahoma there was no cowboys so i was like okay right now Right now, I have the opportunity. I, I have the opportunity to do the cowboy, but how do I make it different? I didn't want to be the brute. I didn't want to be the finisher was a lariat. I didn't, it's not what I wanted. 
I wanted to, to be different. And I wanted to be my own cowboy in a different way. And I was always um, told the, the best uh, characters are, you know, just a hundred percent you, just a real enactment of you turned up the dial times 10. I was a country boy. I grew up on a farm. I've been around it my entire life. Now have I completely like embraced it as my full on, like, that's all I do. No, that's where the twist comes in. Like, I don't have to be like the other brute style cowboys that were, you know, grat or cow fed, you know, rough and tough. I can still be that solid, rough, tough guy, but I can do it in a different way. And I had mixed martial arts training. I did MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, or Muay Thai and Brazilian uh, Jiu Jitsu for two years. So I have a little bit of that training on my hands as well. And, and I took it that way. I said, what if I'm more like a Walker, Texas Ranger? And that's kind of where it took off. Like I said, cool, I'm going to wear jeans. I'm going to wear kick pads that look like boots. That way it gives off that style style element. You know what? Why not? I'm going to do the whole thing Canadian tuxedo style. Denim up top, denim down below. And it, it just took off. Um, I got a lot of, it was weird because I was wearing skinny jeans and stuff at first. And uh, I would get a lot of the, you're wearing jeggings, uh, laughs and stuff like that. But then once I really started working into like the actual solid denim that I had for the first real pair of gear that I had bought for the, for the cowboy, people were realizing, holy shit, he's doing all these acrobatic things in these skin tight jeans, like denim, like, holy crap. And I think that's kind of where it took off. Like I showed that I could do that still while wearing that stuff. And I could also be my own cowboy. I didn't have to be, like you said, the Bradshaws or the Stan Hansons um, or even the Funks uh, or Von Erichs even. Oh, like, fuck did I not mention the Funks and Von Erichs? Yeah, Funks, about Von Erichs. Like, I, I, I got to be my own cowboy. And, and that's what I saw as like the challenge. Like, okay, you've got something. Now, how do you make it more popular? What do you do? So I, I added the, you know, monikers. I did the real, I'm um, the modern day Billy the Kid from the Young Guns. Um, and then I did the real life Woody from Toy Story where I did a gimmick where I was in cowboy, but I had the brown or the uh, blue jeans, brown boots. I did a jacket on the back that had Woody on it, said, you got a friend to me. And I came out to Kid Rock at the very beginning as my song where it says cowboy. And then right before it drops into Kid Rock's cowboy, I had you got a friend of me come out. Or come That's on. fucking <laughs> awesome. And, and I sing it out to the ring. I mean, I, I just was different. I was willing to take something that someone said couldn't be and make it possible. Um, I, I stared them in the face and said, watch me. That's the way I like to look at it. And that's kind of how I've thrived so far in my wrestling career is I like it when people say I can't, I like it when people say you're never gonna, I like it when they put the doubt in my mind and, I enjoy that. That makes me push harder to thrive even more to prove them wrong. And that's exactly what I do with my style cowboy. And I'm just saying it right now, like I told everybody else for the past couple of years, there ain't another cowboy out there like me. I am the one and the only. I am the young gun. Hey, man, I like it. So I'm assuming that's going to be, you know, your strategy is to try to ground them and use some, maybe some of the jujitsu tactics you got against a guy like Mecha Wolf. Yeah. Mecha Wolf ain't going to be easy though. He's got a very vast uh, Lucha background as well. He's, he's very well versed in all styles of, of wrestling. So it's not going to be an easy task uh, at all. And the dude is fast. I'm, I'm usually the fastest guy in the ring. I'm usually being able to keep up with all those guys, but he'll, he'll match my speed. Um, he'll, he'll match the quickness and agility. So it's more of a, when can I make a miss? I feel like is, is what it's going to have to come down to. And he's tough. He's a strong competitor. I'm looking forward to it. And I, and I don't expect it to be easy by any means, but at the end of the day, I think you're going to see my hand raised and, um, I'll be two and O with Pell pro. All right. Before I let you go. Corey and I were talking before we went live and I decided that I'm going to resurrect a couple segments that have become mainstays on this show, but have kind of fallen, fallen to the wayside. Okay. First one. We love to call this one locker room etiquette. Now we've had everybody answer this from Congo Kong to 
everybody, anyone you can think that's been on this show, we've had everything from wash your balls. Don't bring your baby mama into the locker room. <laughs> bring your own wrist tape. Uh, obviously, the obvious ones like shake everybody's hand. Don't take somebody's seat. Don't shit in somebody's bag. Oh, that's no. a big one. <laughs> for you, are there any of them that you would have for a young and aspiring wrestler? Um, my, one of my favorites, and don't get me wrong, I love kids, but don't bring your kids to the show and bring them into the locker room. There is grown men and grown women in there getting changed, and that is not a place for your kids to be. And, you know, people do it more often than you think, and I get it. I understand you have kids and you need to take care of them, but let's just not bring them into the locker room. That's a good one. I could imagine that would be, uh, that would lead to some awkward moments. I could, I could imagine. Very awkward. Very, very awkward. All right. And the second one, it goes right along with locker room etiquette, except this one we like to call fan etiquette. And I brought this up because, man, the more wrestling shows I'm at, especially of the indie variety, good Lord. Sometimes fans do shit that make us all look bad. So <laughs> are there anything, is there anything at all that you can remember any crazy fan stories or any type, uh, any type of stuff like that that you would have for uh, fans when they're coming out to come see the Young Gun? Um. Luckily, I've never really had any problems with the fans on, like, the fan activity. Um, I have seen several things. I've seen things thrown in the ring. I've seen people try to jump in the ring. Um, I, I've seen people, you know, try and get a cheap shot in here to, here, or there if they're out in the, in the area that the fans are at, like, actually wrestling if they're close enough or something lands on them. I've seen them try and do that. But um, I would just say, like uh, – just keep your hands to yourself. It, if I'm that outside seems to working, be the number one that we always get, but you always <laughs> never know what you're going to get out of that one. That's yeah. why I was like, you know, we're going to, we're going to bring this one back. And I mean, especially you need motherfuckers to be keeping their hands to themselves with all this COVID bullshit. Right. Well, hey man, we appreciate your time. One more time for the cheap seats. Let everybody know where they can find you and where they can check out Pele pro wrestling live tomorrow night. You can check out Pele Pro Live tomorrow night at the Legal Brew House in Arlington, Texas. Show starts at 8, doors open at 6.30, I do believe, for VIP. Um, and then you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all at the same, the Young Gun underscore CH. Thank y'all for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I appreciate it. And I, for one, will see you tomorrow. Corey, I would say we banged out another episode of Podcast Gold, just like Devin likes to say. All right, another one and down. We'll be hey, seeing man. you boys Tuesday. Hey, like I said, make sure you're tuned in this Tuesday and every Tuesday and hit that subscribe button because that vlog that's coming to you might just see a young gun on it. Until next time and in the in-between time. Peace. All right.